Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to take a look at this Acer PC from the very early 2000s. If you're a regular viewer of my videos you might recognize this as one of the PCs that I picked up a while ago from the Indian classified website OLX. The other PC from this lot was the Pentium Pro machine which I refurbed to a reasonable standard and you can find those videos linked below in the video description. This machine was the later of the two, being apparently made by Acer and including a Pentium 4 CPU, which dates it at the earliest late 2000. And in this video we're going to go through the restoration of this machine and see if we can get it working. Now, initially I didn't think there was going to be too much difficulty to this build. Aesthetically, it didn't look too bad on the outside other than this superficial marker and a fair amount of rust indicating some water damage at some point. But that was no different to the Pentium Pro machine and that basically worked out fine in the end. However, when I got the case open and had a look inside, I saw that it definitely needed a bit of TLC. The first thing I noticed was that I don't even have a complete PC to start with. The hard disk is missing, as is the RAM. The IDE and floppy cables are also missing, and the power supply doesn't look to be original either. Most of the internals were just hanging on with one or two screws, and it definitely looked like I wasn't the first to crack this machine open. Then I noticed issues with the motherboard itself. Most of the capacitors were either leaking or looked like they were ready to burst. This PC sadly falls right in the middle of the capacitor plague, so this isn't surprising. But if the machine has any hopes of working at all, then all those capacitors will need to be changed before I do anything else. This wouldn't have been too difficult a job in itself. I'm no stranger to a soldering iron and replacement capacitors are readily available. But then I noticed that the heatsink was missing from the chipset here, and worse yet, the mounting point had snapped off of the motherboard. This represents a much bigger problem. I can easily replace the capacitors on the board, but fabricating and installing a new chipset cooler and mounting system is a bit more work, and tip the scales to the point where I just wasn't going to invest that much time in an unproven motherboard. So I had a rethink and decided that given that this is just a bog standard ATX system, there was no point in trying to maintain its originality. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a Pentium 4 system that I would have liked to have owned back in the early 2000s, and I'll reuse what I can as I go. If this were a much earlier machine, I'd be more inclined to try and get it working in as original a condition as I could, but frankly there's nothing special about this machine, so I've got no issue with changing things out. Before any of that though, I would need to look at the case and the rest of the internal components. It was clear there was quite a bit of water damage to the system at some point. You can clearly see the rust on the top of the optical drive here. I'm going to strip that down later, but I wouldn't be surprised if it needed replacing. Likewise, the floppy drive. These are always a gamble, seeing as the insides are a lot more exposed than an optical drive. I'll tear it down later and hope that I don't need to replace it. With everything out of the case, you can see what a state it's in. I gave it a quick hoover out before I dunked it in the bath in some warm water. Everything then got a spritz with my go-to motorcycle spray cleaner, which lifts off most types of grime in my experience. I've got no idea why this works so well, and to be honest, I kind of don't want to know what's in this stuff, because it makes really light work of most types of dirt. It even began to take off some of the permanent marker, which I really wasn't expecting. Unfortunately, that marker was really stuck on there. I tried using alcohol to clean it off, and I even tried the old trick of going over the marks with another marker to try and loosen them up, but nothing worked that well. In the end, I ended up using a dish scouring pad, which did take a little bit of the paint off as well, but to be honest, this case isn't short of a few scratches, so it's not so bad. Now that it's clean, I can see that the front panel has had its share of UV exposure, which has caused the plastic to yellow quite unevenly. I gave the fascia and the drive bay covers a retro bright treatment on my balcony. For parts like this, I use this stainless steel roasting tray, as it's really good at reflecting light onto surfaces which aren't directly facing the sun. 
For this, I use ordinary tap water up to the top of the parts and then top it off with this 12% hydrogen peroxide solution. I then use this glass ornament of my wife's to weigh parts down and then cover the whole thing up with some plastic wrap. Lastly for the case, I took a look at the chassis itself and gave it a good clean with some alcohol and the scouring pad. It has plenty of rust spots inside which I'm not too concerned about clearing off. I just wanted to remove any loose debris that might get in the way uh, or has a risk of coming loose. If this were a more vintage machine or held any sort of value to me, I would look at sanding this back properly and refinishing it. But seeing as it's just a bog standard P4 machine, I'm not putting too much effort into it. With that done, it was time to take a closer look at that optical drive. I stripped it down and everything looked relatively clean inside, so I powered it up on my bench and it seemed to be working. The only issue is that this drive just seems to have a mind of its own and open and closes at whim. Uh, this is most likely a problem with the switch itself, so I'll just try cleaning it with some contact cleaner and if that doesn't work, I'll solder on one from a faulty drive. Lastly, I decided to turn my attention to that non-original power supply. It's made by HCL, which you may remember also manufactured the Pentium Pro machine I picked up alongside this one. It seemed to be working just fine on the bench, but when I opened it up I spotted that one of the capacitors was leaking. I cleaned the tip off with a cotton bud and confirmed that it was definitely on the way out, so would need swapping out. But interestingly, the ATX power supply standard hasn't really changed that much in the last 20 years and machines from the Pentium 4 era will happily work with a modern power supply. So I just grabbed this Corsair unit that I had on a shelf. It's got all the connectors I'll need for this system, including a floppy connector. The only thing I will need to do is split the additional 4-pin block from the 20-pin connector, and I'll need to find somewhere to hide the GPU power rails inside the case. Next, a replacement motherboard. This Intel D875PBZ was just a few pounds on eBay and looks to be in fantastic condition other than needing a bit of a dust. It really looks good and as it's a full ATX board, it would make the best use of the available space in the case with its 5 PCA slots and an AGP slot. That's a good thing because unlike the original board, this one is fairly limited when it comes to rear I.O. There's no graphics or sound built in, so I'll need it to add expansion cards for those. I really like the look of this board, and you'd be hard pressed to find another board from this area which looks as sleek as this one. Intel have done a really good job, and unlike the original board, it looks to have not suffered from any capacitor issues at all. For the CPU, I decided to reuse the original processor from the old board. It turned out to be a Pentium 4 clocked at 2.4 GHz with a 512KB cache and a 533MHz bus speed. This board will support up to the later 800MHz bus Pentium 4s, so I can always upgrade it later as P4s sell for basically nothing on eBay. A fresh dollop of thermal paste and then the clean stock cooler goes back on. I really hated this mounting system that Intel used for the P4 series, and I still do. I'm pairing the CPU with 4GB of DDR400 RAM from Crucial, spread across four sticks. I know that the 32-bit version of Windows XP won't be able to address all of it, but I have the sticks laying around, so I might as well use them. Next, I needed to add a graphics card, and the only thing I had to hand which I know should work is this brand new ATI 9250 AGP card. It's by no means a fast GPU, but it should do fine for most early 2000 games. Ideally, I'd like something with more power, like an ATI 9800 or a GeForce 5900, but the prices for those are just ridiculous right now. I actually bought this card for a separate project which needs a half height card, but as you can see the card only comes with a full height bracket even though the card itself is designed to fit in a half height slot. For the sound card I'm going with this Creative Autogy card. It's a little earlier than some other parts of the system but it should give excellent sound in EAX enabled titles like Doom 3, if it'll run on that Mega GPU. 
For a hard drive, I took advantage of the SATA port available on this motherboard and went with this Western Digital 320GB SATA drive that I reclaimed from a later PC. It's going to be more than enough space for the title song to play in this machine and should be a little faster than an equivalent IDE drive. 320GB would have been an insane amount of storage back in the early 2000s. It's a stark reminder of how much things have changed. Shockingly, that original CD drive did turn out to work just fine once the switch had a good clean, so that went back in the case as well. And then lastly, I added this DVD-CD rewriter combo that I had laying around. This was for two reasons. One, although the original CD drive does work, it only plays CDs, so later titles released on DVD couldn't be installed on this system. Adding this drive also allows me to play back DVD movies and to burn media if I need to. The second reason was that, try as I might, I just couldn't get a decent finish on the blanking plate which had the service label on it. The part that was covered ended up bleaching somewhat, and although it's a bit better than it was, it's a glaring reminder of how much the machine had yellowed. Shoehorning all of this into the case was a little bit of a headache. Luckily I had a few short floppy leads which work quite well, but getting the IDE cable up to the optical drives amongst the mess of spare power supply leads was a little tricky, and the end result is not that neat. But it did all go back in, and then it was time to put on the side panels and see how it looks. Not bad if I do say so myself. It's far from perfect, and in truth the chassis and steel panels could probably have done with being stripped and resprayed. but given that this one has ended up being a parts machine, it didn't really deserve the effort. If this was an original machine from back in the days where OEMs designed everything themselves, then I might have wanted to take it further, but everything in this case can be easily swapped out, so there's no real incentive to do so. Ultimately, what I've ended up with is a machine that I would have loved to have owned back in the early 2000s, even with that slightly underpowered GPU. Windows XP chugs along quite nicely with that 2.4GHz Pentium 4 under the hood, and it looks as fantastic as you remember running at 800x600 on the Samsung monitor. So, just how does this machine perform with games from this era? Let's check it out. Step on one of those red squares on the floor for a bio scan. This is Hit Radio Love Media Station. Just one of 900 radio stations, 300 TV stations, four network, three satellite, ten centers. You're listening to Hit Radio. So you can see the combination of the Pentium 4 and the ATI 9250 graphics card work really well, churning out playable frame rates for early 2000 games. Well, almost. Doom 3 is a slow mess even on the lowest settings, but I do remember that be a problem for even the mightiest of systems when it was originally released. 
There's also this strange glitching on surfaces, which I'm chalking up to this card only officially supporting DirectX 8.1, and not 9, as required by the game. Overall, I'm really happy with how this build turned out. It's a shame that so much of the machine was beyond repair, but that's just how it goes sometimes with retro projects. It's not always worth the time and effort to return parts to their former glory, particularly when you get to this era where machines are still plentiful and often fraught with capacitor issues. It's usually just better to throw them away and start again. Not every machine deserves to be saved, but I'm quite happy this one gave me the opportunity to at least build myself a little P4-based machine. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please give it a like and consider subscribing for more content like this in the future. If you have any questions or comments about this build, I'd love to read them, so drop a comment below and I'll try and get back to you. With that said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.